Hello and welcome to the first lecture on polymers in MATE 310 and 350. In this lecture we'll be focusing on molecular structure, specifically looking at the bonding within and between molecules as well as the overall structure of these large polymeric molecules. Let's get started. So first of all recall that polymers are primarily made up of covalent bonds, particularly covalent bonds between carbon but also sometimes silicon, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, as well as hydrogen. Now, in a carbon-carbon covalent bond, the electrons are shared between the nuclei of the two carbon atoms, as shown here in this two-dimensional diagram. The electrons are kept primarily in this, the volume or region between the two uh, ion cores of the carbon atoms. Now, the central, whoops, the central carbon atom will have covalent bonds associated around it in such a way that it will form an eight, eight electrons in the outermost valence shell of the carbon atom. This is going to provide the most stable structure for the carbon atom. This also results in very strong bonds because the, any individual carbon atom cannot afford to lose one of these eight electrons in its outermost shell, otherwise it becomes less stable. So covalent bonds are very strong. Covalent bonds have another important property and that's called bond directionality. Bond directionality is caused by the fact that the electrons within the covalent bonds tend to occupy a specific region around the atom. So the bonds are negatively charged and push away from each other. This is called bond directionality. For example, in carbon and silicon, the bonds form an equilibrium structure called a tetrahedron because the bonds are kept at a constant bond angle of 109.5 degrees, which looks something like this. If we stack this unit cell up numerous times, we would eventually form diamond or pure silicon. Now it turns out the polymers don't form tetrahedrons like this, generally speaking. So why is bond directionality important in polymers? Well, it turns out that these bonds can rotate. So imagine you had a long chain of carbon atoms bonded together at an angle of 109.5 degrees. As every bond rotates, you're going to tend to form a very twisted chain rather than a single straight chain. And this twisted chain has important impacts on the overall properties of the polymers. We also have to look at atom stability in understanding polymers. So atom stability is measured by electronegativity. The more electronegative or less electronegative, it, electronegative the material is, it will be less stable and want to either give up or take an electron from another atom. So let's look at the primary atoms that are found in polymers. For example, carbon and hydrogen are very common, and these have average values of electronegativity. As a result, they neither want to give up or take electrons from other atoms. In fact, they prefer to form covalent bonds where they're sharing electrons. Other atoms that are found include things like nitrogen and oxygen, which have electronegativities on the order of three to three and a half. Now these atoms tend to be more willing to take electrons from others, but they'll also form covalent bonds with carbon because the electronegativities are somewhat close to that of carbon. Fluorine is one of the extreme atoms. Well, it's the extreme atom. It has the highest electronegativity of all the elements in the periodic table. Fluorine desperately wants to take electrons from other atoms, and it will form covalent bonds with oxygen, nitrogen, carbon as well, and is often seen in polymers. But it has an important effect on polymers when they see things like fluorine. It tends to cause what's called polarity in the molecule. Let's look at polarity a little bit more closely. So we have this idea called molecular polarity, or dipoles, that are created when electrons spend more time in one region around an atom than they do in other, other regions around the atom. This difference in electron distribution is caused by differences in atomic electronegativities. So for example, let's look at water. In the case of water, you have a high polarity on the back side of the oxygen atom, in pink in this picture, and you have a high positive charge around the hydrogen atom. So there's a polarity of a negative pole on one side of the molecule and two positive poles on the opposite side of the molecule. Now this polarity is caused by the fact that hydrogen and oxygen have a relatively large electronegativity difference. The polarity of the water molecule gives it a relatively high surface tension and that's why water beads up on your windshield when it rains. On the other hand, ethane is a nonpolar molecule. And the reason for this is that carbon, which makes up the backbone of the ethane molecule, and hydrogen have relatively similar electronegativities, so there's no polarity within the molecule. 
and you get a nonpolar molecule, which tends to spread out and has a low surface tension. Secondary bonds also occur in polymers, and they're actually very, very important to the, the bonds of, or the properties of polymers. Secondary bonds are also known as intermolecular forces, and these are always weak bonds that occur between molecules, not within the molecule. There are several types of secondary bonds, but the most important for polymers are hydrogen bonds, which are basically dipole bonds between hydrogens and atoms of oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen within a given molecule. And then there's van der Waals bonds, which are dipole bonds between polar regions of a molecule, which are sometimes caused by vibrations in the molecule. As one atom shifts position gradually, it tends to cause a slight dipole in the molecule. These are also known as induced dipoles. So a good example of a polymer that has um, van der Waals forces is polyvinyl chloride, where you have a strong bond between the hydrogen atom in one polyvinyl chloride molecule and the chlorine atom in another molecule. This bond, this increase in the van der Waals bonds in polyvinyl chloride makes PVC very rigid compared to most other polymers of the similar structure. Now van der Waals forces act over very short ranges uh, and the reason for this is because their energy well curve is very steep. It's not very deep which means that the um, bonds themselves are relatively weak but they only extend over a short distance and by two times the radius the interatomic spacing between two atoms uh, two are not the bond has essentially disappeared so if you can separate two molecules from each other they won't tend to interact but when they're in close proximity to each other they're bonded tightly to one another by these weak van der Waals forces so let's take a look at some different co uh, covalently bonded materials and how that the, the propensity for covalent bonds versus van der Waals bonds affects their properties. So for example, density. Density has covalent bonds in three dimensions, in all three dimensions, and no van der Waals forces acting between the atoms. As a consequence, the carbon atoms and diamond pack together very densely, resulting in a relatively high density material. And it has an extremely high melting point because it's relying on the strong covalent bonds between the, the atoms. Graphene is similar, although in this case it's bonded by sp2 bonds rather than sp3 bonds, so it only has covalent bonds in two dimensions, so it makes flat sheets. The density is slightly lower because of this, and the melting point is slightly reduced, although it's still very high because graphite is held together again primarily by covalent bonds. Now polyethylene is entirely different. It has covalent bonds in one dimension, which is why polyethylene forms long chains rather than sheets or three-dimensional objects or molecules. As a result of these chains, polyethylene has a very low density and also a very low melting point. Now the low melting point indicates to us that the, the strength of the intermolecular forces is dependent strictly on van der Waals forces rather than on covalent bonding. And lastly is methane. Now methane involves one carbon atom bonded to four hydrogen atoms. So there's no covalent bonds between carbon atoms in methane. As a result, it has very low density and an even lower melting point. It turns to gas at room temperature even.